Hello everyone, welcome back to Karna Academy. My name is Karna and today we're going to be talking about pancreatitis. So starting off with what is pancreatitis, well obviously it's going to be inflammation of the pancreas, but then I think it's good to understand why we are getting inflammation in the pancreas, what the pancreas normally does and how we would manage it. So what are the three main digestive enzymes the pancreas makes? It obviously makes things like uh, insulin as well. But for the purposes of this, we'll be, let's talk about digestive enzymes. So it makes lipase, amylase, and trypsin. Or trypsinogen, that's it, that gets converted to trypsin. Now, how does this happen here? So you have your um, acinar cells that generate or secrete digestive enzymes. These then travel through the pancreatic duct out of the, um, into the pancreatic, then join with the common bile duct to, um, the, sorry, joined with the bile duct from the gallbladder to form the common bile duct, which drains into the second part of the duodenum through the ampulla of vata. Now, what are some important things to know? We need to know that the enzymes that the pancreas normally generates don't cause digestive action in the pancreas. I think that's important to know. How does that happen? Well, the, bio, the pancreatic ducts are lined with an epithelial layer that's protective, and also, a lot of the enzymes that are secreted are in their inactive form. So things like trypsin, which breaks down protein, is not actually produced in the pancreas. The pancreas produces trypsinogen, which is then activated later down, later down the tract. So lipase breaks down fats, amylase breaks down starch into simple sugars, and then trypsin breaks down proteins. That is the principle of why we get pancreatitis. So what's going on? Unlike other conditions like appendicitis, diverticulitis, where the most, the, where, where you have inflammation of those organs, but the reason you have the inflammation is going to be mostly infective, right? You have a bug, you have a collection that gets inflamed, gets an infection, but pancreatitis is a very different. The way I like to think about it, pancreatitis is your industrial chemical disaster. For a lot of reasons, and we'll go through the cause of acute pancreatitis in a bit, we have a disruption in the normal drainage pattern. This leads to all of these enzymes leaking out into the surrounding space and eating up everything in its way. Now, going back to our enzymes, we have lipase that breaks down fat, amylase breaks down starch, and trypsin that breaks down protein. Your pancreas is mostly made up of these things. And therefore, if you have a situation where you have these enzymes being released and then activated in the pancreas, you're going to lead to destruction and inflammation of the pancreas. So what causes acute pancreatitis? And the mnemonic commonly used, I'm sure you've heard of this, is I get smashed. The most common cause is gallstones. And I'll try to go through this list. I won't spend too much time, but I'll talk a bit about why each one of those cause pancreatitis. Gallstones. Let's go back to this picture. If you have a gallstone blocking the common bile duct, what's going to happen? You're going to have build, you're going to have retrograde flow of bile both up the bile duct as well as through the pancreatic duct. Now, if you have high levels of enzymes that are being still being produced by the asthma cells but can't go anywhere, they will start leaking into the surrounding space, and that's going to lead to pancreatitis. Next, we have ethanol and alcohol induction. Um, and this is commonly heavy alcohol use. Trauma, steroids, mumps. Mumps is another infected condition that can um, have widespread levels of inflammation. ERCP. Now, ERCP is interesting because ERCP is a procedure where we use a scope, go down the esophagus, through the stomach, up to the second part of the duodenum, and then insert a probe up the bile duct. And this is commonly used for... Um, things like gallstone destruction or retrievals, using stents as well as taking biopsies sometimes. Now, in this process, you can cause blockages and you can also cause local irritation of the pancreas, which is why you get pancreatitis. Another cause which really is surprising that it, there's scorpion bites. Now, you may be thinking, well, why does scorpion bites cause pancreatitis? I never knew, never cared to know, but for the purposes of this lecture, I did, in fact go back and have a look. Um, I say go back. I never learned it in the first place. I just did a quick Google search. Um, apparently what's happening is a lot of people, not a lot, some people have a genetic predisposition. Um, what happens is when they have the scorpion bite, you have a change in the membrane structure of some 
enzyme vesicles. And if the vesicles can't leave the asnar cells and go out of the pancreatic duct, they kind of get stuck in that pancreatic space and then leak out and then cause inflammation. Again, this is the lowest yield thing ever. It will never be assessed. And please forget about it. But I just always found it interesting, but never cared enough to look why scorpion bites can cause pancreatitis. Now, how is this going to present? The most common presentation you will see would be severe, constant, upper or epigastric pain radiating to the back. And that's quite important for your exams because that's how it would be asked. It's also, I guess, relevant if you want to sound impressive and do a good job to ask further questions, which may assess other important things. So we know that one of the important causes are gallstones and therefore asking whether they have a history of gallstones, whether they've had a gallbladder, that gallbladder removed, whether they're jaundiced, right upper quadrant pain, cholecystitis, cholangitis, cholidocolitis, all those things are relevant. Peptic ulcer disease, again, because medications like NSAIDs and steroids can cause both. And peptic ulcer disease can also present with severe constant upper abdominal pain. Um, and they're quite scary. We covered peptic ulcer disease in our second lecture. And then you have malignancies like liver, pancreas, and stomach, which can again present with upper abdominal pain. And pancreatic cancers can also compress the pancreatic duct and cause that backflow and inflammation that we talked about. On examination, the two important signs that you should really be aware of are the Collins and the Gray Turner sign, which can be seen here. So we have the Collins sign, which presents as paraumbilical bruising. And then we have the gray turn the sign, which is a flank bruising. Now, why do we get this? If we go back to the enzymes themselves, we know that the enzymes in, important ones for this case are lipase and trypsin. Now, most of your subcutaneous tissue is fat and a bit of protein and connective tissue. As you secrete lipase, you start breaking down all that fat and cause hemorrhage and cause a bit of bleeding. And therefore, that can lead to bruising, um, which is why you get flank bruising when you lie on your sides, as well as epigastric, uh, sorry, paraumbilical bruising, just because of proximity. Now, in terms of investigations, we want to do some bedside tests, blood and imaging. And I always like to split them up into those three categories. So bedside, blood sugar levels, because you have shock to the pancreas, you can often lead to acute, acute um, hyper, hi, hi, glucose, <laughs> I've completely blanked on the term for high blood glucose. Okay, that's not good. <laughs> you can also do a urine dipstick, a urine amylase in terms of blood, FP, LFT, UEC. I won't read through the list, but on the next slide, I have some indications as to why we do those. Um, hyperglycemia, of course. <laughs> oh, it's been a long day. Uh, urine dipstick, that can show up as glycosuria and they can also have ketones and pancreatic um, amylase can also be excreted to the urine and be picked up as urine amylase and it's a quicker test to do in terms of bloods fp lft uec to grade their severity and that's important to know how they're doing otherwise medically in terms of blood glasses we can either do an arterial blood gas or an avg or a venous blood gas or a vbg um, i've gone previously in this lecture series talking about the differences between the two but for your level ABGs are good for looking at oxygenation. VBGs are good for looking at everything else. So hypoxia is a rare complication. And therefore, if you suspect it, do an ABG. An ABG can also tell you about acid-base disorders. And then a VBG would be good for acid-base, but not the best for hypoxia. We also do a CMP because hypercalcemia is a very, very important cause of pancreatitis. The reason for that is because calcium ions play a crucial role in the release of pancreatic enzymes from the asnar cells and therefore high levels can cause excessive release and therefore cause excessive irritation and then we talk about the two enzymes that leak into the uh, systemic circulation amylase and lipase amylase uh, three times the normal limit is considered sensitive for pancreatitis serum lipase is a better overall test but it's more expensive to do in terms of imaging we can do a contrast abdominal CT, that is the gold standard investigation. We would see fat stranding around the pancreas because you are now digesting and eating up fat, and that's going to present as fat stranding and inflammatory changes or edema around the pancreas. It can also give you an idea of pathologies that may be contributing to this or incidental stuff in the area. 
So things like pancreatic pseudocysts, pancreatic atrophy, especially with chronic pancreatitis. So that would help point you to more on an acute on chronic pancreatitis picture. And then pancreatic masses or masses of the biliary tree. A chest x-ray to look for a pneumoperitoneum for perforations. And then, an, and then an abdominal ultrasound for coexistent bla gallbladder pathology. So very commonly, if they're presenting with purely uh, upper quad, uh, right upper quadrant pain or epigastric pain, you want to rule out a colli. Um, and we quite often do an abdominal ultrasound as the first line investigation for that. And as you can see here, we see some fat stranding around the area as well as edema around the pancreas itself and the pancreas appears to be quite atrophied as well um, this is something you do not need to know you do not need to know how to interpret cts at your year level but i think it's just good to see also this is the gallbladder if you can see and this might point towards the presence of stones can you see these hyper intensities so all these things are stones and you see a dilated gallbladder but the gallbladder wall itself doesn't appear to be thick and there are no signs of um, inflammation around the gallbladder itself. So you could have a gallstone that's causing obstruction at the bile duct, but you don't have a polycystitis just yet. You can also use a, a staging score called the Glasgow Staging Score to assess the severity of pancreatitis. The reason this is important is because any pancreatitis that's severe should be treated in ICU because they can decompensate very quickly. This is not just because you have a lot of inflammation in the gut, but also you can um, go into a hyperglycemia, you need insulin therapy, you can have electrolyte disturbances really quickly as well. And these are the criteria. I won't spend a lot of time going through this. I think you can just read through that. In terms of management, the treatment for mild to moderate pancreatitis is often relatively supportive. Our goal is to provide fluid therapy. Um, just so we ensure that we have adequate tissue perfusion and um, oxygenation. This is also going to go hand in hand with our surgical workup because these cases may require further surgery. And therefore, we want to keep them little by mouth, put in an NG tube, two large bow IV cannulas, and start them on the IV fluid therapy. Most probably going to be 0.9% um, so just normal saline. But I'm, yeah. <laughs> And IV fluid therapy actually has been shown to have the greatest impact on final outcomes. Uh, monitor their vital signs, oxygen saturation, and urine output, as well as their electrolytes. Replenish them if needed. And then obviously they're going to be in pain and may feel nauseous. So give them adequate analgesia and antiemetic therapy. Then we can also have some specific treatments for underlying causes. So if they have gallstones, we might do an ERCP to retrieve the gallstones, and this is actually indicated if they have concurrent cholangitis. Cholangitis means that there is a blockage and there is bile draining in, draining up into the systemic circulation, and that's an indication that there's a gallstone, and that's going to be treated with an ERCP. If there's also inflammation of the gallbladder, you can also go forth with the cholecystectomy at the same time. Hypertriglyceridemia is also a big cause. And a, high, a triglyceride level over 10 is really, really worrisome because we worry about acute pancreatitis, which is why we use things like phenofibrate if it causes that, if it crosses the 10 level. If that is suspected to be the cause, you can also perform plasma electrophoresis and insulin therapy as they help lower it transiently. And then long term, you would obviously be talking about lipid lowering therapy, as well as investigating causes for their um, hypertriglyceridemia. Having a triglyceride level over 10 is almost unseen with purely metabolic disorders. It is very likely that a patient or such a patient would have a familial hypercholesterolemia. And then with alcohol, and if it's alcohol induced, we want to check their magnesium and phosphate levels because we worry about refeeding syndrome. We want to supplement thymine because they'd, all, they'd often be deficient and consider diazepam for acute withdrawal. In terms of chronic pancreatitis, now chronic pancreatitis is where you have ongoing injury to the pancreas. Most of the causes are due to excessive alcohol intake and defective ductal secretion. So what's going on here? So over time, you've had multiple episodes of acute pancreatitis, or you've had ongoing inflammation at the level of the pancreas. That's going to lead to distortion of the ductal system. Now, if the ductal system isn't 
well formed, you're still going to be secreting enzymes, but you're not going to be able to release them adequately. And therefore, this is going to lead to um, leakage of those enzymes in the surrounding space, as we've already talked about, causing the same thing, um, but more so from a chronic perspective. Now let's talk a bit about pancreatic cancers. Now, pancreatic cancers are the fourth leading cause of death and typically affect people aged between 60 to 80. These cancers are mostly cancers of the pancreatic ductal system and not the alpha or the beta cells. Um, those would be called um, insulinomas, gluconomas, but not typically pancreatic cancers. Risk factors include smoking, obesity, heavy alcohol consumption, and chronic pancreatitis. All of these factors contribute to low-grade inflammation in the pancreas. It presents with your typical cancer-like symptoms, diarrhea and steatorrhea, because you may have obstruction of the duct, and therefore, if you're unable to secrete lipase, you will have steatorrhea because you'd have excessive levels of fats just leaking out through the stools. You can also have epigastric pain radiating to the back, very similar to what we talked about earlier, as well as the corvocere sign. Now, what is the corvocere sign? Corvocere sign is specific for head of pancreatic cancers. This is basically, if you have a cancer that's blocking the um, common duct as it's coming out, you can have obviously retrograde flow. That retrograde flow is going to go partly into the gallbladder, distending it, which means you have a dilated or a palpable gallbladder, but it's not going to be tender because it's not inflamed, right? You don't have gallstones causing obstruction, causing an infection. You just have backup of bile. So you're going to have a large gallbladder, which is going to be non-tender, and then jaundice because it's going to go up here, but it's also going to go up here into the liver and then into the, into the systemic circulation. And pancreatic cancers overall have a very poor prognosis. Investigations, very similar to some of the stuff we've already talked about with pancreatic pathology. But some specific things I want to mention is a CA199, which is very specific for pancreatic cancers. You can also then do <clears throat> an, uh, a CT abdomen. This is going to be useful for looking at disease prognosis and staging. And then we can do an ERCP. The ERCP, again, would allow us to perform something called an EUS FNA or an endoscopic guided um, fine needle aspirate. And this would tell us the pathological findings, but with a, a mass that's at the head of the pancreas, it is very unlikely to be anything else. I'll briefly, very briefly touched on pancreatic anatomy because we talk about locations. So we have the tail, the body, the neck, and then we have the head, which is broadly composed of the head proper and the unsinate process. Here is also just the same thing, but in the context of surrounding structures. As you can see, it is highly vascular. It's very close to the IVC. It's very close to the aorta as well as the duodenum and the spleen. Because of this, the potential for metastatic spread is very, very high. Also, because it's so vascular, Surgical approaches make it quite, the surgical approach is quite limited and you can't often go for uh, the surgical approach. In terms of location, the most common site is the head. Um, you can also have cancers of the tail specifically, and those two are considered operable, broadly speaking. And we'll talk about this here. So because the only curative approach we have is surgical, if you can treat, if you can operate, always operate. If it's a, ca a cancer of the head of the pancreas, they undergo a, a, a procedure called a pancreatic or duodenectomy. I did I get that pancreatic or duodenectomy? <laughs> that's a mouthful, um, and that's called the Whipple's procedure. It's a huge, huge, huge procedure that I've actually I saw a few weeks ago, and it was quite overwhelming and very, very long. As you can see, what they do is they dissect part of the stomach wall, they cut through the pancreas, obviously, they cut through the third part of the duodenum, they cut through the bile duct, remove the gallbladder, remove most of the um, duodenum, remove the pancreas, remove the stomach, join all of that back in and call and create anastomosis here as well. That, that's a very big, 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 big procedure. Um, but it is done at Monash um, and has relatively good outcomes. If the pancreas is localized to the tail, you can then resect the tail and also uh, resect the spleen. Other things we need to consider, 
could be stent implantation for cholangitis prevention to prevent further blockages, a gastroenterostomy for gastric outlet obstruction if it's pressing on the gastric um, and the gastric opening, and then if they have an ileus, you might consider PEG uh, or PEG tube feeding, and that's often really really important because a lot of these patients would be malnourished and losing weight quite rapidly. And that's the end of our lecture. Thank you all for coming. As always, any questions, please feel free to send me an email or get in touch with me on Facebook. And as always, please look after yourself and please look after your loved ones.